Hey. Hello. Hey, Ozzy, hey, how, how are you? you? Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Thank you. Well, I, we're, I'm in the afternoon now, just about, but good morning to you. Good morning. Let me see here. Let me change something here. Uh, I got to start my video. I've got like a some old information on here. So there we go. Awesome. Cool. How are you? <laughs> there we go. Great. Great to meet you. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank where, you for, where are, what's that? Where are, you, where are you located, Dave? I'm located in Toronto, Canada. Okay. Cool. And you are in California, I'm taking it? Yeah. Well, right at this moment, um, uh, I'm in uh, San Diego County, northern San Diego, and I've uh, been here for a while, moved from the Bay Area quite some years ago, kind of did that, finished it, had a great time, still talk to my friends. Awesome. Yeah, I've been to San Diego a bunch of times, love it down there, great yeah. city. Very consistent weather, I've noticed there. It used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I guess compared to Toronto or the East Coast or anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, well. Yeah. Toronto sometimes is hotter than it is on the equator. So, I mean, you know, it can get a little humid up here and it can change everything. Quite uh, I hear you. That's funny. I see, I'm seeing some posters behind you and stuff. I just taken a whole bunch of stuff down off the wall, including my uh, a dead poster that was given to me by, God, who was that? Um, Rock Scully had a poster uh -huh. he wanted me to have that something, meant something to him. And, <laughs> I'm looking, at, I'm looking at this, you, if this, if this room sounds empty, it's my wow. studio. It's, it's my studio that used to be baffled and everything. And we're getting ready to move out. We're uh, moving to Costa Rica. Oh, wow. Awesome. No, and everything sounds great. No worries Good. at all in the sound okay. and the quality and the background. Everything looks amazing. And uh, right. congratulations on moving down to Costa Rica. That sounds amazing. A nice, awesome part of the journey for you. Yeah, it is. It's a big chapter right now. My wife and I have been traveling there for the last two years, especially during pandemic. And <clears throat> it was it's a kinder and gentler society down there. They don't question. Um, yeah. I don't know what your political beliefs are, but the idea that you just kind of take care of each other is probably a, a better idea. And, and people were not, you know, they, they'd mask up and they'd wash up. Every single place had a wash basin and you'd you know, wash your hands and dry up and put on a mask and go in and be kind to one another. And we found that where, especially where we were in Guanacaste, they were uh, being very, um, very low rate of the, of the, the infection. And mm. we were lucky, you know, whatever, lucky or whatever, however it goes, sure. we never got it. We went ahead with our, our uh, immunization and everything, but you know, so big change down there. And also there's the weather, the Pura Vida they have, it's like, for sure. One of my favorite countries in the world is Jamaica. And so, I mean, there's a lot of ties with Canada to Jamaica. Absolutely. But again, it's not it's not Canada. It's different down there, right? The culture, everything. And I agree with you. I mean, not that I'm speaking negatively about anybody anywhere, but we could all take a lesson with more compassion yep. and kindness. And part of what my mission with my YouTube channel is, is to connect like-minded people who want to keep pushing that message of be kind for no reason. And, you know, Jerry, Jerry created some wonderful music for all of us to love and engage with. And that spirit lives on and lives through us. And that's kind of what, you know, the spirit of the channel is and the contacts I've met over the years from it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned this because I, this is usually my first question. It wasn't where I was going to go first today, but you did say you took down your Grateful Dead poster. So did you ever get to see the Grateful Dead live in concert? Oh, sure. Okay. Do you remember your sure, first I, I did, You know, it was, uh, interestingly enough, because I was on the East Coast um, working with, um, it was called the Fillmore Agency, and it was Bill Graham's uh, agency, uh, booking agency. So it was located at the Fillmore East. Were you, you ever familiar with that place? Yeah, of course, absolutely. In East Village, and um, our manager, a good friend of mine, Chip Rackland, um, was, uh, was an agent there. And um, he would always want me to come down to the shows and I always wanted to check, you know, whoever was there. I mean, I saw Elton John on his first, you know, first tour when it was just uh, him and a trio and, you know, he had just put his album out and everything. And I'm not a huge Elton John fan. I, I realize he's an entertainer. That's what he did. But I gotta tell you, seeing that guy for the first time um, on his tour when he was, you know, a, basically a side man mm -hmm. um, in and around London. And he was well known for being a, you know, just a keyboard player and sometimes voice for him to become, you know, who he became, you know, everybody's got a shot at it, right? It's like, it's, sure. it's a one in a million shot that you're going to do that. And again, I'm not a big fan of his, but I, uh, I do see 
the, he did have a, a, he had a voice, he had a talent, and he had a vision of what he wanted to do. Boy, oh boy, did he. So yeah, the, the Fillmore was really fun. And of course, there was also the Beacon down there. There was other theaters where I performed with Jerry and um, did some other, you know, some other gigs. But I did see the dead there. And I got to tell you, um, I'm not the biggest fan. Um, and and, and um, Jerry knew it, and being Jerry, he laughed. And of course, sure. I would get <laughs> from him. He goes, "Hey, you know, we're playing at the Coliseum this week, you know, out in Oakland or something." I go, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm washing my car, so I can't get out there tonight, but I'll see you." Know, and we would laugh, and he would, you know, he had a great sense of humor about things, and. I didn't have to, you know, put my, you know, <laughs> bestow my blessings on anything in his life, and he didn't have to do it on me. And I, I, I realized that being, I guess I was probably in my 30s, you know, then, mm -hmm. and um, I knew everything. I, I knew everything at 16. Don't tell me anything. I already know it, you know, and I know my future, and I'm going to die then, and this is what I'm going to do. And um, fortunately, <laughs> none of what I thought or wished for came true. <laughs> well, and that's, that's a great segue for this question. I mean, I did read, I did a lot of research before, obviously, looking you up, looking at your history. Um, mm -hmm. And I saw, obviously, you play with a lot of wonderful musicians. You've done some great work over the years with lots of people, even even down to your the DVD, the DVD series you created as well. And some of the stuff you do with, you know, everyday people, you know, to help them and nurture them and whatnot. So I'm curious, you know, Van Morrison, Jerry, Jimmy, Chuck Berry, what was your most memorable musician to play with? <sighs> If you recall, and if you've got a great story, I'd love to hear it. You know, it's like asking me my favorite movie. It's really ah, hard. There's are moments of each one. Sure. Uh, Van, Van was difficult to work with. I don't know if you know anything about the man, but he's very difficult. I don't have to, there's not gossip. Um, and um, I can tell you some stories that I probably don't want to go into because they're not as complimentary. And probably, again, I was, you know, if you're part of the story, then you were there, you know, you're in it, you, you allowed it to happen, whatever you, what you allow you to teach people to do. But, um, you know, uh, moments on stage with Van were inspiring because of who he is. He's not pleasant in any way. He fired guys on stage. I mean, he, he fired a guitar player from at the Santa Monica Civic <laughs> Auditorium. And nobody in the band believed it was happening, and certainly not the audience. They thought it was part of a gag, but, you know, band doesn't have a sense of humor, nor does he have gags. You know, it's like he fired him and he left, backed up, and you're gone, and finished the set without him. You know, so those things, you know, that, that would be a memorable moment up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> it doesn't have to be good music. It could be also experiences, too, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's, here's some things that, that, that pop up to me. Feeling completely free. Um, uh, I have to say, I was playing with a friend of mine, Jimmy Dillon. Uh, he and I had a, call, a band called The Edge. And Jimmy then went on to be a blues guy, and uh, we formed Blue Star Music Camp together. He actually formed it and then asked me to come along and work with kids on it. And we were able to bring in, you know, um, uh, Carlos Santana and um, mm -hmm. Huey Lewis, and um, gosh, I'm trying to think of the people that, that, that Bob Weir came by. A lot of people came in. Tommy Castro, just a good, hard blues guy, had his daughter in the camp. And he came in. A lot of the guys just gave you basically rock and roll 101. They, mm. they gave you 45 minutes to the kids. And, you know, they, there's an inspiring time there to see kids who only have, you know, uh, you know only have their, their superstars in front of their minds. You know, how did they get here? I want to become, you know, fill in the blank. But there's so much more to it. I mean, not sure. everybody becomes a Madonna or whatever, you know, whoever your idea of a superstar is, or certainly a Michael Jackson, anybody. But there's so many other people along the way. And to, if you want to stay in music, find a way to do it. So mm. my situation, and I'll get back to me, is I realized I was a side man. And it was fun being a side man because I had those moments and I was free. But when you come home from touring or from the session you were called to, you are... You, and again, casting no dispersion, a waiter. <laughs> you served your last meal, you got your last tip, and now you're at home waiting mm -hmm. for your next, you know, serving job to do. Nothing wrong with it. It's just that that's what you're doing. It's, and the artist goes on creating. And if they call you for the session, that's great. But if you're not producing, writing, or, you know, being personally involved in, in, in the day-to-day -day activities of this is when we're touring because it's, it's uh a convenient for me and not for 12 other people. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, everything. Sure. 
on that. And there's ego involved, but there's also reality. Here's, you know, this, this is why we're doing this. This is the person that we're following. So the agency and the management and, you know, the roadies. <laughs> but oh, I get it. I, I, I get it. I help, I help a lot of local bands. And the one thing I won't do is I will not be their manager to book them for gigs because I don't need to deal with musician schedules and things like that. So I let the musicians deal with all that and I take care of the marketing and the live streaming and everything else and the support and being a nice guy and whatnot. But that one part of it, I hear what you're saying and it's not, yeah, I let them deal with that part of it because they know their days and what they're willing to deal with more than I do and I don't want to fight through that uh, noise. <laughs> you, just, you just said the word business. and. Uh, <laughs> music don't mix especially for telling a young musician or something telling you know ozzy at 16 that you you know you, you better get some business i don't know why i hire people for that because yeah. i've been <laughs> you know uh, mansions and people doing you know doing my video no it doesn't happen that way all the time of course <laughs> and uh thank god i didn't get my wish because <laughs> i wouldn't be here speaking to you this i'd be true. Pushing up daisies because I would have done to myself what so many of my friends, you know, unfortunately did. And here we are looking at um, what people learn about music early on. And some of these, you know, old timers, the guys that are on the road or whatever, they can tell you, you know, there's more to it. You got to watch your own business. You've got to look at what's going on. If, and, and I realized at a certain point that it was nice to be a side man. And it was, it, I, I wasn't responsible. I wasn't you know, after the gig, but I also wasn't in control of anything. Yeah. So someone said to me along the way, you know, if you were, you know, producing or writing the songs, you know, and here I am at 35, 36 going, how do I do this? So of course I would try to pick up every band I could. And actually until I met up with, um, well, formed a, uh, an alliance with Craig Chiquiso, um, he and I put together a, a, a demo mm -hmm. that, um, it was just timely. It was called Acoustic Highway, and we 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 put together you know four songs, shopped it around through management, and um, it got picked up by um, uh, well, it was higher octave, but they were part of a bigger label and part mm -hmm. of you know whole uh, whole machine that we got into. And so I had about a nice 16, 17 year career with Craig, and we did a, about twelve albums. It was really nice, but that's where I got in. I don't use like to use the word control, but at least I can tell you that I had some say in what the business dealings were, a lot of the same, because we were partners. So I was able to create the music, record the music, you know, produce everything that was going to go on there. And of course, if you're successful with, I'd say by the time you've done two albums and the second album got nominated for a Grammy and it was like it got to the number one billboard chart, that's considered successful. Yeah. Now, we are able to basically tell the label what we want to do. Mm -hmm. and not pushy because you've been involved with you know, the recording business. You are at their mercy. You are at the mercy of their marketing and their sales and everything like that. They may love you to death, but if you're not selling units, you know, you know, one through 600,000, you're out. One million feels better, et cetera, et cetera. So being in, you know, taking the reins, I think that's a better word for it. Take the reins and, and be creative in there. Now, that was a nice, I had a nice, you know, 16 year run with that. It was a lot of fun. We had a lot of, now talk about some inspiring times on stage. Yeah, I have to, I have to give it a little bit of a shading. And that is that I was the writer, the producer, and we mixed the together. It got mastered by somebody else, but mixing it. So we took that baby from, you know, infancy right through. Right. We, so when playing that music uh, in front of audiences, especially at award ceremonies or when we were on a bill, a big bill or something like that, it's inspiring more than just the music. In other words, was it the lick that got there? No, I, I, I wrote this lick two years ago, but it's being done today. I'm getting a pat on the shoulder from the business. I'm getting a pat on the shoulder from finances because I also would say to kids, you know, financial success isn't success is not everything in this, but it's the oil, it's the gas that keeps it going. I can be, I mean, geez, I just talked to the guy yesterday about a guy named Terrence Trent Darby. He yep. was a tremendously talented singer, but he got in his own way. He had already, you know, he was already through the golden door when he hit. And um, my management was handling him through, you know, Fillmore, et cetera. And I watched him. 
I watched him. I went to see him live. I saw him actually. I, saw, I think I saw him out here at the um, Avalon. Wait, whatever the ballroom was out here, not Avalon, the other ballroom. Um, and he was just great. Absolutely great. I said, this guy's the next Michael Jackson. He's it, man. Great. Nope. He got in his own way. He had already, he'd already told people what he was doing. He was already ordering people around. and well, He'd already made it, as they say. I've already made it. You can't tell me. And he didn't do the work, you know. I mean, when you're on your first tour, man, you you got to have some humility. A friend of mine, a friend of mine called him when we were going out and doing, uh, uh, when, I, when I first came out with Finger Painting album, he got Richard, Richard Elliott, a great saxophone player, a really great guy. He was in Tower of Power. That's what mm -hmm. I met him. Just a great guy, soulful guy. And he said to me, um, I, and I was working with Craig at the time, and, we were, and I had a break, and I was going to go out and promote Finger Painting, and the first part of it was going to Borders, books and you would have to go from place to place. I did about four of them in Arizona, two in New Mexico, four in Southern California. And you go in and set up, they'd help you and everything and put up a PA. And Richard Elliott went to me and says, ah, yes, the humility tour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, exactly. You got to do what you got to do. And there's that business thing. I'm a musician and a producer and a writer. I write the best music. I write the best songs. I wrote a hit today. I mean, people and actually looked me in the eye and said, dude, I wrote a hit today. I really, I'll, t I'll tell you in six months if you did, because there's a lot of, you know, there's, there is a very long road between now and a hit. But um, Absolutely. You, work, you work on a song and you get it out there. So you, you have to see what, it, what accolades you get once you've done it. But um, writing and producing music that is from my heart is really, I, I, I needed to have the financial reward so that I could keep doing it. And mm. I know people who have day jobs that play better than a lot of people I know that are out there on tour, not play better, but have more creativity. But it just didn't happen. Yeah. The gas didn't get put in the tank and they're gonna go ahead and it may happen later or whatever. And you know, you, you in the business long enough to know that this is it. It's not by talent. It's, you know, if it was the NBA, and I yeah. can shoot three quarter. You bet. I'm in. I, that's it. But you can shoot ten thousand bands with three pointers, and they ain't gonna make it no. just by the the drop. It's For by sure. the drop. It's gonna Very great insight. I appreciate that. Uh, this that kind of segues me over nicely to a bit earlier question in your life, Stephen. I've actually reached out to some of the people on my channel to ask them for some questions as well. Um, so Stephen Fish wanted to know. He read that you in high school in the '60s toured as a backing musician for the Shirelles. I'm wondering how you got that gig and what that experience was like. Oh my God. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to truncate <laughs> this because sure. It's slice of life, man. It's not a postcard. It was a letter from home. I was um, 16. I was with a band, a little band of mine from uh, from high school um, called the, the Wizards and Oz, and yep. I was booked by a, a, an agency in Newark, New Jersey. And little Ida Mallet, she always had a gig for me. She put later on, she put me out with Chuck Berry, which was a lot of fun. I was uh, 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 meeting your meeting your childhood idols are very eye opening. But um, I took a part of the summer when I was only six, just had become 16 years old. And I went on tour with the Shirelles and I was uh, on a bus tour. And we did what they call the Chitlin Circuit. And we did the South. And um, uh, I learned a lot. The gals were very wonderful. They were very sweet, very nice. The road manager was a mean, mean guy. <laughs> and, uh, he, he stiffed me. That's how I left the tour. Oh. I, uh, I had to go back to, I had to go back to high school. And I had told him I was going to, and he said to me, oh, okay, you know, to, you know that's okay, no problem. But I, uh, the, the gig was given to me because I was in my own band, and they liked, I was playing guitar at the time, and I was a good enough for the guitar player. Um, Joe, Joe Richardson, was his, his name? Boy, I'm, I'm trying to remember his name, boy. And he was a great guitar player. He played with King Curtis, mm -hmm. and he taken the job with the Shirelles, and um, he was band leader, basically musical director. MD on a tour is a nice gig when you're working like with you know, a singer or anybody. Jerry, Jerry had an MD and it was yeah. John. John Kahn pretty much ran the show musically and he was real good at it. Um, so here I am, kid, um, on the bus, people doing a lot of drugs and I 
I didn't even know what it, what it was. I mean, I'd had a couple beers and um, we toured and I think the tour started, you know, up around Philadelphia and swung down through the South and deep South, you know, a lot of bowling alleys and stuff like that, BPOEs. And um, the Shirelles were not the, you know, the, the superstar group. They weren't, you know, the Supremes. They were uh, already an oldies group. Mm. And um, by the time we ended up in Dayton, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio or something like that, I had to leave the tour. And he said, okay, see ya. And I said, well, how am I, you know, I, I need my check. And he goes, no check. <laughs> oh. Whoa, he was, yeah, he was mean. So that, I learned a lesson there. Mm -hmm. Get your check, cash it, then quit. <laughs> <laughs> I and quit and then say, can I have my money? <laughs> Lessons learned along the way. Rock and roll 101. Ah, hey, absolutely. And, and look, and exactly, it took you somewhere as well. And that's amazing. And I uh, really appreciate that. Um, so you were there kind of, what was it? This is a question from the 11. Um, he wanted to know what it was like to be there at the birth of synthesizers and being used in popular music and to play with that new technology. What was that like? I mean, Ness is going to obviously say go into the Jerry stuff in the 80s. And I actually wore my tiger hat specifically for the call because that was Jerry's guitar oh. when you guys played together. So. But when you said a supervisor, what was the word? I'm sorry. Synthesizer. Oh, like you, you were there at the birth of the synthesizer, right? So he wanted to know what it was like. What was that like being a part of that or being there for that and how it was being used in popular music and to play with that new technology? What was that like for you in terms of your experience? 30 something um, re living resistantly uh, in my life. Um, I, I love the music I listen to. I listen to Al Green. I listen to uh, Marvin Gaye, I listened to, of course, the Stones and everything like that that came along. But I kept hearing rhythm and blues as, you know, where that, that talent that came from the church, that people were innately born. Like if you were in the church and you were the lead singer in that church, you were on your way to becoming Sam Cooke because you had it. And the people in the church knew it. In mm. our other society of rock and roll, unless you were, you know, like in my life, you know, like, uh, you know, the Elvis Presleys and the, you know, uh, Little Richards and the Chuck Berry, you sort of had to make your way up through it, you know, through the through the through the pillars of of the rock and roll machine. Um, so I I was resistant to become a part of anything that was I would call um, folky, like the Dead. Now this is me. That looking back, it was a wonderful experience. If I had a chance to you know just do something else, I'd say, oh yeah, man, get over there and do that. Don't you know broaden your 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 horizons. You don't always. It also there was that was another time that who you were playing with was very important. Jerry was very important to the world. Wasn't important in my world, but that worked. It worked for him. He would laugh when I would say anything about what we we're doing, but I didn't laugh at him. I never laughed at Jerry, and I certainly couldn't laugh at. at anything that was already a machine. I just said, I don't choose this for myself, but here's oh. Jerry, big rhythm and blues fan, you know? Big blues and rhythm and blues fan. And Khan, I don't know if you know anything about what John, he had a record collection that would fill both of our rooms and mm. would go out, spill out the door. The guy had, sorry, the oh. guy had, Turn this down. Um, he had a lot of music in his life and he he exposed me to some early stuff. I mean, he had Robert Johnson tapes, you know, before I heard about, you know, I knew who he was like in the idea of you know, what he'd done and everything, but he had some hidden tapes and he got the people. He, he was such a fan of music. So the synthesizer, here I am playing Fender Rose piano, starting out on basically World at Sir and, you know, Grand and, or, and, or B3. I played B3 when I was in that band produced by Jimi Hendrix. And so I was, you know, multi-instrumental, but mostly uh, choosing the instrument that was the best sounding. So Rhodes, Fender Rhodes, I had a great dynamite piano. It was really super. So I played that on part of the tour with Jerry. Jerry and John said, man, we got this thing called an OBX, the Oberheim. Really love the sound of it. I went, yeah, I'm with you. I'm there. So we did a couple gigs. I think we did Keystone. I think we did uh, whatever that um, Santa Cruz. We had we had some gigs in, in in the Bay Area that were just, I mean, fun. He, he, you know, Jerry could. The word could get out with no advertising that Jerry was playing at Keystone Berkeley on um, Thursday night. You know, at nine o'clock, and he 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 could put that message out at five o'clock in the afternoon, and there would be a line down the block just waiting to see that, you know, because 
you know, there was something in the word of mouth was better than any other. Right. back then. It was just like everybody got it. John and Jerry decided to synthesize it was cool and because it has a, 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 they call it the, the tone bar, the wiggle bar. I could, you know, emulate Jerry and do things that were fun for me. And I was a fan of Marley at the time. So the Whalers were doing that a lot. There was a lot of synthesizer work out there. So I was feeling like, you know, I could really explore into this. And that was just at the time that we hit a couple of those tours. Um, when I first played with Jerry, I think I, I was with Hunter. And um, he only saw me on the roads because I, I had to cover at a gig for um, uh, Keith Godshaw. He was um, not doing well. And um, he didn't, I was, I was playing with Hunter at the time and I ended up doing, finishing a gig for him. And I just finished up on piano and it was really, you know, we did that, we started on piano, it was, it was all right. But the synthesizer was fun. If I were to redo it, I would have to take myself off about 60% of it, put myself back on roads, and then um, have the songs that I did on synth or synth soul. In other words, like comp, comp, comp. The other thing, Jerry, to me, hit my heart all the time because guitar players, they can play a lead and then they stop playing and they go, yeah. Or go get a cigarette or go talk to somebody. No, good guitar players, Clapton. People like that, they comp and they they make part of the thing. It's a comp behind the solo that's coming up. Jerry loved just loved comp. He was really good at it, and he was real happy. He, was, he some of his smiles came while he while he was doing you know playing behind other people. His no doubt, no doubt, and it's interesting because you you have like some of the most unique sounds with JGB, and your time there was one of the shortest. I mean, other than Nicky Hopkins, who was only there for like five six months, you know, you were there for almost a year with the band, and you just have this very unique sound with Jerry Garcia band that no other keyboardist. You know, Keith was more of a jazzier player. Merle had a little bit of everything. Melvin's got the gospel, and it's very heavy organ sounding. You just had this unique, different sound. You and I always call you are. I always call that period of Jerry pocket Jerry. And that's essentially you. It's a time between Merle and Melvin, essentially, because Keith being with the Grateful Dead, it was sort of, you know, very similar all the time. And it was just interesting. And this actually segues nicely into Michael Fitzgerald's question. And I'm wondering if you were aware of this. That's what he wants to know. Jerry always seemed, and, and more so than what I've listened to and known, comparable to every other, you know, keyboardist and Jerry Garcia band specifically, he always seemed to give you great space for solos and lead improvisation relative to other players. Were you aware of that? Were you conscious of that? And how did that interplay kind of work together in that regard? Because it's like Jerry would play something like a solo and you would almost try to recreate that solo. And then what I actually found was you actually, in my opinion, push Jerry more than other keyboardists that I've, that I've heard him play with. And that's one of the more fascinating things for me. So I'm curious if you have any insight on that as well. Yeah, I'm looking back. It's great to get old and look at, look at where you were and what you were doing and what was moving my... Uh, what was moving my my dials at the time, and um, I'm going to go back to a place that when I came to to California, Van Morrison moved me there. I was on the East Coast, and I had been playing with other people and playing in New York City and lived up in Woodstock. People played together. There were a lot of good bands up there, a lot of really good put together bands, and they jammed. And we did some jamming and everything like that. But it was when I got to to Marin County. And I had a big plan, by the way. I'm going to L.A. right away. I'm just, you know, I'll just be here for a few minutes. And I'm, I'm headed to L.A. when it's really happening, you know, and I'll, I'll form my own blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> went on. I, I went to L.A. They kicked my, my butt right out of there, you know. Uh, people were double, double booking sessions, you know, and saying, oh, no, you are not here today, you know, bomb. And here I am in little old Marin County, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, if you didn't have a gig or something you'd just go to the lion's share or to sleeping lady or to um even the, the you know, i would have to say more yeah more than san francisco it, it was the keystone berkeley freddie herrera had a way of, of doing music in his place if you walked in and jerry wanted to jam everything stopped you just yeah. didn't sing at at the at the place called the lion's share in san anselmo yeah. you could walk Anytime you could, you, it would be a Tuesday night and Carlos Santana was, you know, soloing on stage with Bill Chaplin because they were jamming, you know, or it would be, you know, whatever put together band was at the moment. Some of the, some of the sons, some of the guys from, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the dead, whoever was around, you know, Khan would come there and jam. And that's where um, Olden and the Way played there a lot. It was a regular gig for them at the, at the, at the, at the lion's share. So 
that idea of jamming was you jam until you're done. <laughs> you know, your solo is when you begin it and end it. It's no, you know, no, no 16 bars, no, no 32 bars. No, it will be 128 or 256 if you care to, <laughs> you know, how long do you want to play? Um, that's the great thing about jam is you give space to the other guys and you take the time to, you, you take the time to comp behind them. And so when I got in Jerry's band, I, I didn't have to recognize it. It was Jerry. It was inherent in him. He wanted to hear you play, do your solo. They used to have a saying about solos. You open up low and you end high. You got oh. eight, 16 bars, whatever it is. You just do that. And, it, you, you know, that's the way you do it as a pro, you know. Uh, that's sure. what you get paid to do it. We know how to make the audience happy. But jamming with Jerry was not making the audience happy. It was making you happy and Jerry happy and everybody got around. So we were really doing each other. And you would wait till you were done. In fact, there was times when I was finished a solo and he would just comp for the last 16 bars because he was not ready to play yet. And he would go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chew on that for a minute. You know, and we would talk about, you know, after his solo, he didn't have to signal me. I knew what was going to come up. He was like sort of inherent. So yeah, the space was always there. Um, he just loved to experiment. The guy, he, he did live an experimental life. God gifted him with a platform in which he could experiment, you know, on whether it was banjo or pedal steel or, you know, whatever it was the dead it was and is. And then he had JGB to do even further work. Wow, it's pretty pretty awesome, and thank you for sharing that. I, um, uh, yeah, it's just it's quite an amazing time, and just again, all the different stuff you did there. Um, another question that someone had: um, What is one experience? This is from Richard Gerson. What is one characteristic you experienced in Jerry that would surprise his fans and all of us that you think of? Um, I, I think I told this to to. Somebody, I, I mentioned this. Well, it's not Jerry is a big sci-fi fan, and um, when I went to have breakfast with him one day, we were you know in New York and we had a day off or something like that. And he said, "You want to just you know chew the fat?" And you know, so we said we had breakfast at the hotel. Um, and he found out. I mean, I had mentioned things before, but when he found out that um, that I had actually, when I was reading science fiction, and that I had met, I just mentioned in passing that when I was going out with this gal. She invited me over for lunch and I met her dad and her name was Tandy Sturgeon, his, his Theodore Sturgeon, Ted. Here's my dad, Ted. And he goes, Jerry goes, oh, you mean what? You met Theodore Sturgeon? Now he's probably, I think, I think Jerry mentioned that he had in passing met Heinlein or somebody like that, but a lot of big fans of those writers, you know, those people, Asimov. And at the same time, you know, I uh, bumped into him in Woodstock. So we talked about science fiction. We didn't need to talk. We'd already talked till we were, you know, till we were done, especially back when banter with Jerry in the, in the dressing room was just free for all music, you know, whatever you got on your mind. What, what, you know, what did you like? What was the flip side of that? What was the flip side of that 45? Oh yeah, I remember that. I learned it, man. You know, and, um, but Jerry was a big science fiction fan and he had a suitcase full of books. He went up and he pulled out two of them. He says, you got to hear it. You got to read these. So for the rest of the two, I read this Asimov uh, short stories. It was really that I didn't have before. But he was a big fan of that. And, and he, his jaw dropping experience was not that I worked with Jimi Hendrix. It was that I had met <laughs> Theodore Sturgeon. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's great. I really, amazing. Just hearing some of these stories, just amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. One quick question Icemond wanted to know, um, what did the band or Jerry think of audience clapping? Did it annoy, affect the performance at all? He's been wanting to know this for a long time and I haven't really spoken with anybody else that was there. So do you have any feedback on that at all? Well, if the audience doesn't clap and the audience doesn't pay and they don't have a gig, right? Correct. So they're there would be somebody who goes, I don't need them. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm my own, you know, driving force and everything. But I think all of us knew that we needed the audience to be there so we could continue doing what we're doing. But I think, and the other thing is Jerry and John had a pretty funny, um, pretty funny take on, on audiences. They did not diss them. They simply went, we're in our own vacuum here, you know, no matter what. I mean, you, I, don't, I, I can't remember how many other per people performed with Jerry, but I just remember sometimes coming out on stage, um, there would be a roar when we came out on stage and there would be a five minute lull while Jerry decided he would tune a little better 
or um, we would talk about something before we did it or you know and be damned they you know we're not going to start it we're not going to get on to the next one we're not going to do anything until we're all ready and it's going to because you know you don't you know you don't know it but it's going to get better hopefully better because we have communicated about it or i have tuned my guitar you know that's sort of that idea so the applause was there i think um there was a joke at the end that if how long can we wait back here to do the encore will they stop let's see jerry and john you know we a couple of places that were like a given like you're in you know the capital or one of those places, you know, they're not going to, you can stay there for 45 minutes. They're not going to, they're going to do that. But uh, yeah, they would laugh and go, should we go out? Nah, not yet. You know, they would joke about it, but they knew they were going to go and give the audience that. We already usually had a song or two in our pocket that we knew we wanted to do as, mm. as because it's more like encore songs or no brainers. You yeah. don't want to, here's a song I just wrote, you know, thinking about, you know, the depths of, you know, all philosophy, my greatest Gandhi thought, you know, no, get it's going to be, you know, wild thing. Okay. Everybody, three chords, you know, yeah. four chords, three chords, let's do it. You know, and that's fine. <laughs> I love it. That's all. And that's, that's a great little, yeah. And that's a great piece of information. Like, I mean, that most people wouldn't know. I mean, being backstage, I mean, I'm hanging with musicians all the time and, you know, backstage with them during intermission, I won't say a word because it's their creativity and what they're going to do. And I don't yeah. want to interfere with that process. So hearing it from your side, where in some cases, you know, Jerry, obviously we know was a jokester to hear, you know, that, yeah, let's see how long, let's see how long the platform before we go back out and, you know, kind of, you know, Jerry being Jerry in terms of you guys, when you walked out too longer or talk for a bit before you actually start the show is exactly. also always, part of it, building that anticipation and, you know, really just being you and not having to conform per se, not that anybody was conforming, but really just being you. And I think that sometimes made it even more special because, you know, it just was Jerry being Jerry and you guys came along and were part of that as well. And what an amazing insight. How long will they wait, you know? <laughs> How long can we stay here? <laughs> that's great. I, that's that's amazing. Um, so interesting because we talked. You, you just briefly touched on the music for a minute, and there's a really interesting piece of music that was played only with you and Jerry in that particular iteration of the band. And Jack Straw, one of one of my avid uh, audience members on the channel, his name's actually James. Um, he wanted to know because he wanted to know how this came up. So it's in reference to the After Midnight Eleanor Rigby jams back into After Midnight. We're done while you were part of it. We're, what are your memories on how this came about? And feel free to expand. Do you have any specific memories of the King College version, which was fire by the entire band? But how did that sort of morph and come into existence? And again, it was only played six times. Six times that was done, and it was only done with you. So any, any other insight as to where that came from, how it happened, and what kind of joy or experience you had playing that? John Kahn. John Kahn. It was his idea. And he spoke it to me before we ever did that. And he said, uh, you know, we do this after midnight jam. I think it'd be fun. I said, you know, bring it, bring it to, we didn't do the R word too much. The re rehearsals were not, <laughs> not, not smiled upon. It was more like get to the gig and play. We'll, we'll do it there. We planned some rehearsals and um, sound checks were also not, you know, spoken of very highly. <laughs> <laughs> but we did have to uh, show up for that one. I do remember um, working that working that out, and it was funny how uh, John saw a correlation between it, and he shared it with us, and it, it it made no sense, and it made perfect sense. So we went with it, and um, I mean, Dear Prudence was not a song that would you would think that you would want to jam on, it's just not there. But it is because if you take a piece a piece of it. It works. It's not just the chord progression. It's the power. It's the drive. It's a drive on it, you know. And um, so sometimes when you decide, sometimes think, wow, that's that sounded a lot better in my mind than it did. Mm -hmm. We did, but this is one that um, John brought, and he he didn't have to do much. Um, he nurtured it because he had, he knew where it wanted to go. Um, and he didn't have to do much salesmanship on it because you know he'd, he'd already mentioned it to me i was way on board and then jerry uh jerry picked up on it and it did take a couple of um you know pre-sound check like setting up sometimes we drop drop in and see if things were working that's basically we call it a line check you know, like, you know there wasn't really a sound check a line check make sure you're all, you're all plugged in and everything's the way you want it um they're gonna have to mix it for you you know and you, you trust in them 
Um, but we, we worked a few pieces. I, I remember a couple pieces of it that needed to be reworked. And uh, yeah, it always worked out, worked out well. I don't know personally why it was dropped, other than that was the moment we did it. And um, that was its moment. Jerry had a huge, not talking about a repertoire, it's, it's enormous. Well, it's actually fun. One, of the fun, one of the fun things I like to do when I do a show is I will put up fun facts every so often about who wrote the song, how long, how many times Jerry played it, who he played it with. And then, you know, there's sometimes it's like, okay, everyone buckle in. This is a rare one. And people like so many times because most people are deadheads first. And a lot of them don't know the Jerry Garcia band the same way for whatever reason. Yeah. And it's addictive when you go to the shows and you hear an audience recording, you can hear people in the audience yelling, Dark Star. And it's like, this band doesn't play Dark Star, <laughs> you know, but people don't know. And they're, at, they're expecting uh, sort of a recreation of the dead experience. But really that's not what that was at all. And so it's, it's fascinating because again, those songs only live for a short period of time or some of them did. And, and, you know, that's again, a lot of, you know, and you tell me about John being so much the musical director, because sometimes we felt, at least in the later years, I mean, maybe after you left, I felt the shows revolved around sometimes Jerry's mood or how Jerry was feeling or, or and you could kind of hear that in some of the later stuff and that this, the set list was set up in a way to, to talk to Jerry's pain specifically or anything else he may have been experiencing. And so it's interesting to hear that little difference and that, you know, John did have a lot of that say in that, but at the same time, it was obviously a collaborative thing for, for everybody. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> hey, look at that! I do know a little bit what I'm talking. I'm not a musician, so I try my best to. Um, so, just quickly, how did you like? When when did you get the nod? How did you first get the call to come and play with the band, with JGB? Um, no, I knew Con. Yeah, I knew John. He was um, gosh, he is. He came back east to uh, audition for Paul Butterfield's Better Days with Merle. I don't think those guys ever joined it. I remember the other guys that got into the band, you know, it was like a, another one of those plum positions. <laughs> but shortly after that, I moved out to Marin County and there was John, you know, and he was on the scene. He had his number, I'd already spoken to him. And um, years go by, you know, you, you know, I had my checkered career, whatever was going on in the 70s. By the end of the 70s, um, I hooked up with Hunter on, uh, at the end of, of it, uh, he was going to do a tour behind an album that never really got, I don't know if it ever got finished, but um, he had a tour booked and he didn't like his keyboard player for some reason. They spoke, however, I don't know how to say it. They spoke, um, uh, they, did, they didn't like him. I don't know who he was. Um, and they wanted a different feeling. So <laughs> I was a guy, I was, I was used to that. I mean, that's, that was that time that it was basically, you know, I'm done with this hamburger. I want the other one, you know, yeah. and, not dissing on the person. There was just so many people out there to try out. And Hunter, Hunter had heard me. I know he heard me somewhere where I was playing. Probably, probably with, maybe even with Vit. I can't remember what it was. Something. So Hunter liked it. Hunter said, "I want you to play." I joined his uh, thing. It was called. It was a band called Comfort, but they really just became uh, his backup band. And and we went on a uh, did a tour or two, and um, we were in the process of recording. Um, I had already subbed a year before that with um, let's see, the very beginning when I was playing with Hunter, we were, I believe, opening for a show in Little Less the year before that at Sebastopol. And there was my, it just asked, can you sit in for the rest of this set? Um, Keith's not doing well. John Kahn said, I know Ozzy, get him up here, you know, boom, done deal. You know, there were two other acts or something like that. No, get him up here. I finished the night. And it was, you know, just handshake and wink, wink. Yeah. We were all it, was, it, was, it was just, it was, you know, pretty much just like another night at the Lions share. We all did that, you know. And Jerry made sure the, the songs were known by me for the rest of the evening. So and then time passed after that. I'll tell you, it was a few months. And, uh, I don't know if he put the band to rest for a minute because I didn't see them around for quite some time. And I got the call from the rocker, Rock Scully. <laughs> <laughs> our our man in Havana. What a guy. What a personality. I don't know if you ever met the guy. Never met him. Saw what he did, but he was a book within himself. He could be. He could definitely be a uh, a character in uh, in in any um, De Niro movie you want. I mean, he was just the greatest. Real guy. Real a real person. Um, he had the jail stories and everything. Yeah. You know, it just was just great. And so Rock called me. He said, um, Jerry. Uh, is putting the band, you know, putting a new band back together. He wants to uh, get a new feel. Would you be? And I said, sure. And he says, and you, 
And you know what this means when you become the keyboard player. But Jerry, you'll probably be the Grateful Dead keyboard player. I said, no, I won't. No, I won't because I don't, I want to live. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair I decided that now, now I have a child, I have a child, I have a daughter, I have a child, I'm not 16 and planning to hit, you know, a cement wall at 21. Yeah. Um, I'd love to live. So, no, I'm, I'm going to keep this gig. And, you know, and, and I, I think they were searching all over at that time. And, you know, it was, it was not a shoe in, but that's the way Scully sure. sold it. So, but that's okay, Rock. I just, it would be good to play with, uh, with Jerry. Jerry was generous to his uh, musicians, generous musically generous financially and he would always be um i don't know he would try to do the best for us i mean i can i can tell you this now because he's he's gone but this, and this is just it, it after all these uh, shows that were recorded and some were some a few studio tracks a couple of uh dylan does garcia i think i had a couple uh tracks on there that i did with him that we recorded and then uh live gigs became albums jerry left it in his will that the so the royalties would be split four ways if there was four members, eight ways if there was eight members, 12 if there was, however it was, it was split that way, the royalties. Other musicians didn't do that. Other singers did not do that. You got paid, you got your 550 bucks or 1250 or whatever it is you got for that gig. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Here's your tip. You know, and um, Jerry wanted people to be um, rewarded for, for what they did. And yes, I was paid for the gig. He was paid for the gig. Everything was fine, but the the royalty was given to us in, in perpetuity. So that's a very generous thing to do. And that's a that's the kind of, that's if anything, I tell you a, a bit of who Jerry was, and you know it still is because he's there's, there's a thing called the Jerry Garcia Fund, JGF, and it goes on. It does good things. His daughters were involved in it, and um, I knew them when they were five, <laughs> and here they are. Grown young ladies, uh, you know, doing, you know, carrying on, carrying on a legacy. Well, I hope this maybe speaks to one of them soon. I mean, Dennis McNally was my first interview that kind of started this series off. And what's interesting, because you've mentioned John Kahn so much, we actually have what are called Kahnisms. So on my YouTube channel, when we're chatting, any word that has a C-O-N in it becomes a conism. So Jerry or Ripping Solo, it was, I concur, or that I've got convulsions and everything has become just. So this is actually what I call the conversation series. That's what this is. So I just want to let you in on that a little bit because we're trying to incorporate that spirit of everybody always there. And back to your point about Jerry being so giving, it's sort of why I do what I do also is I have enough. I'm not saying I'm rich. I'm not rich by any means whatsoever. I have enough. I have a wife, I have a home, I'm, I'm happy, I'm comfortable, and I've got some free time. And so with my free time, I've dove into this Jerry world with my pick and my ax, and I've made it a mission to dive deep and find rare recordings that people may never have heard, or people that aren't savvy enough to find them in the, in the BitTorrent worlds or in the world where those exist. I know how to find that, and I try to make it easy for users to find them on the channel, at the same time create a community from all that. And sometimes, and this is actually a little segue here because you mentioned a little bit before, you know, recently I started doing some Robert Hunter shows because people want to hear the bard and hear, you know, sometimes how it was originally thought to be said and the lyrics might be a little different. And you touched on that a little bit. And Susie Fairfield, another avid um, member of the channel as well, they're all the time, love her dearly. She wanted to know what that was like touring with Robert Hunter specifically. She know you toured with comfort and she loved to hear a Robert Hunter tour story if you have one. And because he, he, he toured so little. So she just wanted to know how that was in person. If you have any, any kind of history about Robert at all. Bob was a very um, uh, monk-like person. I mean, and not in his in his lifestyle, but he was very very quiet. He was not not outgoing at all. He was he was uncomfortable going on stage. And when he did, he would be himself, and he would like you know be Bob. I, I, I'm going to do the song this way. He couldn't quite understand rock and roll, but he certainly understood how to write a lyric. So being a lyricist to being a performer was um, a bit of a a bit of a jump for him, but. He got into that, I'll call it an uncomfortable place, and went out and performed in front of folks. So as far as a Hunter story, he is a story. <laughs> he's top to bottom. And other. He's, he's a, he's, he could be a Quentin Tarantino character. There's no doubt about it. They, 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 say, they, they broke the mold with him. He was like nobody I ever met. And he was, he's more of, a, <clears throat> more of a, a writer than I would think of. And he was a writer. That's what he did. He lived in his, in his lyrics. He lived in his head. And he lived in that, whatever that period was, he loved to 
go for the rum runners or the promontory rider or whatever it was. He lived yeah. in that. You know, I don't know if you know Peter Rowan. You yeah, of Peter? course, absolutely, Peter Rowan for sure. I know I saw play with him a bunch of times too. I have an album with him, I believe. Some good track with him. So his um, uh, um, pre Mexican Air Force days, they were fun. And he's another guy. He lives, you know. <laughs> He lives out here. Pete's talking to you. But he, there's somebody out there. There's another, he's got a little guy on his shoulder talking about another time, another place. So Hunter was like that. And um, no, Hunter was not anything other than, you know, uh, a lovable, odd guy. But if you, if you looked at him for, um, uh, sometimes he would look at you incredulously like, and I didn't take it offensively. I just went, he's probably, he's probably chewing this over in his head. Yeah. Processing. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then it was fun because his, his tours with him were, were one thing where he would uh, trust the band to do the thing. He would actually ask, am I doing that too long? Is that part too long? Can I? And I did. There's another place I got long, long solos. He wanted me to play a lot. He loved it. He loved having the music because he liked hearing what Jerry did. And um, so uh, when, once we were out with Jerry and, and Hunter was on the tour, um, he just took his place very well. And, and nice, it's nice because being a lyricist like that, you've you got to have a lot of uh, um, people in the audience go, oh my God, this is the guy that wrote the songs. And here he is, you know? So yeah. Yeah, they were getting a special treat. The Hunter, Hunter shows were special. For sure. I mean, I, do, I actually just premiered one of the sets on my channel recently. And so, very, and actually, if I'm not mistaken, I believe I heard Hunter even playing acoustic guitar during during the show as well, but I can't recall off the top of my head. It isn't noted. So you, you might know better than me, but that's fantastic. Um, I got only got a few more questions here, and then I do something at the end where I wrap up with a really fun kind of thing here um, um, as well. Zumo61 wanted to know about working on the Gumby soundtracks. He loved that stuff. So can you, do you have any fun, any, any fun anecdotes or stories about working on Gumby? <laughs> There's a, up there in the corner. Yeah, I see it. Pokey. Gumby and Pokey. Let's see if we can see that. I'll take it real quickly. I just saw a guy about some, I, got, I have a message here for me. I got to get it off. No, no worries. Okay. Here's, um, there's, there's a scene from Ark Park where Art says, hi, Ozzy. Thanks for the great music. Rockin' Ark Park, Art Cloakey. And then there's Gumby up there jamming the, the songs. Yeah. And there's Gumby, the, the movie. Gumby won the movie. And I do have a uh, huge poster that uh, Art, I think, I, mean, I, went to, I went to Gumby's 50th, and I think it was Art's 80th or something like that. And, well, let's see here. Gumby. <laughs> Art Cloakey. I should, I'd rather talk about Art Cloakey because... Sure, whatever, absolutely. This is your time, please. There's, there's another character that's from a book. You know, like if you could put him in a Tarantino movie, he'd do just fine. And um, he, he was quite a character. He really believed in Gumby. Gumby was real to him, was as real as, you know, another person. And he, he adored him. He adored what he did. His wife, Gloria, was on board with it. Um, she was the voice of uh, two or three of the characters. And um, uh, Art was just a sweet person. And when he was doing Gumby the movie, he had had his, you know, he, he was not like, he wasn't Walt Disney. He wasn't, you know, uh, you know, world renowned, but that, that, that was a, this is a niche thing, let's say. Absolutely. And um, so, so uh, funding for this thing was tough. He was, he was funding a movie, not a, not a little TV show, you know, whatever it was, 20 minutes or something, 25 minutes. And um, he fell on hard times and he had his usual person doing the music. And it was a bit, when I heard it, I, I, it was like the music from the TV show. It was a little odd. It was more so almost like, you know, whimpery sounding out there. Nothing, nothing, I'm not saying the guy did bad music. I'm just no, saying. Just didn't sound to you, sure. Droned on and you know, you know, it didn't go anywhere. His wife, Gloria, said, I think we've got to come up with the times. It's 1990. It's no longer 1950. So let's... Um, Let's write some, let's get a, a, a songwriter in there to do something to do. And, and Gumby was making a video. It was the years of MTV. So um, they heard the music I was doing actually with Joe Satriani. Um, I had done a little, just a little uh, version of some music in the studio with him, who called the Mendocino All-Stars. So I asked Joe, I said, Joe, do you want to play on this? He said, oh yeah, great. No problem. I'll do it. You know, I'll, 
I'll, I'll be gone, be damn it, you know. We joked and and um, it was all set. The sessions were all set. I'd written the songs. I'd written Art Park. I'd written Take Me Away and the, whatever the crawl song was at the end of the you know the crawls at the end of the thing. That, I don't know that was me and that it was fun. And um, it was cool. I was going to get to I was going to get to produce the sessions. Here we go. This is me writing and producing. I went. I don't care what I'm doing. I don't care if it's for, you know, yeah. a dentine commercial. I'm doing it. It's me. And so I get a call from Joe's manager. Joe can't do this. You know, he needs to have, a, you know, two, two semis full of guitars. And he needs 50 grand and everything. I'm like, well, the entire budget is like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I was kind of heartbroken. Like uh, Joe called me and said, I'm sorry. I, I can't buck my management. It's like they, they, they run me. And I'm like, yeah, you're, we're all... You know, you could have slipped away, but that's all right. No, no big deal. It's not like, you know, music is music and people accept what other people are doing. I stopped at a uh, place to get a beer on the way home from the city of telling these folks, you know, it wasn't, you know, having met with management and everything. And I bumped into Craig Chiquiso and he's having a beer and he said, you know, it's uh, five o'clock somewhere. I actually was five o'clock. We started talking. He said, well, what are you doing today? I said, I was in the city. I, was, uh, I, got, I got bumped from this. This project, I had to bump Joe Satriani from it, or I got bumped by Joe's management. He goes, wow, that's funny. I just quit the Starship today. <laughs> I'm like, really? And he said, we had a disagreement with Mickey, uh, did this and did that. And um, it's pretty much in the tank as of today. He said, I don't, I don't have a job. Um, you want a guitar player? I went, sure. So I went to Art and I said to Art, Art, I, don't, I lost Joe and he loved the idea of Joe Satriani. When I told him Craig, he loved the Starship. He said, this is great. I love the guitar player. He says, great. That's just fine for me. No problem. Just shift one to the other. So I'd already written the tunes, did the sessions with that. And it was a pull, like any other project. There's, these things usually don't go, you know, A, B, C, and it's done. You know, there's usually a bunch of other slow, you know, B, 1, B, 2, B, 3. Yeah. And um, it, it, took, yeah, it took, it, it took a, you know, better part of this. It's seven months to get even the recordings and everything mixed and everything because... Uh, they lost their funding for it, but the movie did come out two years later. Uh, and Craig and I had already recorded Acoustic Highway because of that project we were doing together. So one spawned the other. We already knew each other, but we hadn't really worked on anything other than jamming <laughs> at the Sweetwater. <laughs> it all comes back to jamming at Lion's Share, jamming at, you know, the, yeah. the Remember was you jammed with your friends. Hey, you want to do a project? Yeah, no problem. Now, the early days of networking, right? But this is ne musician networking, essentially, right? You know, hey, that's a great, that was a great jam. Let's go do something now. Hey, I like you now, let's go do it. And you just, you just like moving heads, right? Just rolling through different people, trying different things. I mean, even, and it's interesting because when you were, when you left JGB and um, Jerry met up with Melvin, what I found interesting there for a very short period, he had two keyboardists, Jimmy Warren. And Jimmy Warren had a similar electric sort of keyboard sound, more like a synthesizer kind of thing. And I almost felt like that was a compliment to your, you know, not being there anymore, particularly, or it was Jerry melding the two sounds until eventually he kind of went with more of the organ Melvin sound of things. So it's interesting, again, how, you know, in those little lead ups to that, I mean, if you go back to as early as 75, right after Nikki, you know, you had... You had a couple little sessions there with with with, with um, uh, Booker T, not Booker T. Oh my God, James Booker. Sorry, uh, but James Booker there for a bit, and then that moved over to a couple sessions with Howard Wales, and then yourself, and it just that's who John Conn was connect with all this. He was good friends with Howard, um, James Booker. He was a huge fan. He had all I had James Booker forty fives. I shared them with John. He didn't have two of them. You know, his record collection was so deep. When he, you know, found out that he could, you know, work with a play, uh, a player, that was it for him yeah and thanks for that idea that there was a compliment to me there's a musician's thing that uh uh yeah i'm not i'm not scared of any musicians but i wouldn't be in a, want to be in an organ contest with melvin seals <laughs> you know? our father who art melvin he yeah. um master he, of the universe as jerry called him you ever heard melvin just do a gospel walk himself you know solo just play scare the pants off any keyboard player he's like wow Man, can that guy do it? He's like something else. He's just, and then he could be eating a sandwich while he's doing it. He doesn't care. It's like it's, he could do it in his sleep. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be the organ player just before Melvin or after Melvin, for that matter, <laughs> out, of, out of personal pride, you know? Yeah. And you know, it's, so interesting, it's interesting to say about well, Mel because he's like the one person left over from this. Well, Phil as well, if you're going to the Grateful Dead side of things. 
I will never not miss an opportunity to go see Melvin Seals. I, I, mean, I fly to Jamaica every year to see him for four nights at a Jam in the Sand event where he plays with DSO. And it's that smile, his everything about him, his energy. I got to hang out with him again at Skull and Roses recently. Just there's something special about him. So you talking about him like this, it just really means something to me because I'm gonna go seek out some other stuff of his now that you mentioned it. And he just really is special in terms of his play and, and how he complimented Jerry later on and everything about that. And, you know, yeah. it's amazing and it's interesting. I don't know if you know the story, but James Booker, when James Booker first came to play with Jerry, they, in, in the rehearsals, Jerry didn't have the heart to tell him that James was playing with them. It was that because James thought he was the lead as opposed to you're not, you're playing with, no, it's, hey, this band's playing with you, James. And it's very interesting how those two shows have a little bit of a different yeah. musical selection because of yeah. that understanding yeah. and non-understanding. John didn't bother explaining it to me. He said, just show up. <laughs> you know, we'll <laughs> that was exactly. Well, I mean, hey, he's in town. Let's call him up and no one has any idea. It's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. And that's interesting to hear that as well. And you mentioned, you mentioned Alvin and how what a great musician he, you know, is, and he goes on, he still carries on. He's one, the, the one link with everything because he was there for a long time. The other one was, uh, was Merle Saunders. Yes. And Merle was one, I mean, God bless that guy. What a, what a great person, uh, his whole family. I mean, uh -huh. Merle, you're a little Merle, and uh, I call him little Merle because he was a kid when I met him. And um, Tony, you know, Tony uh -huh. All, all that family, all the music that was there, the way, um, the way Merle shared with people. He's, I can, he's one of those guys that I can, he's right next to you. When you, you sure. think of right next to you there, that leather hat, the beard, that, that, there's. Well, that was great. actually one of my favorite interviews I did or conversations I had was with Tony Saunders. Oh. I spoke to Tony a few months ago. He reached out and he just sat here and just told all the stories of, you know, being at home and Dion Warwick walking in and, and, you know, Sly and his dog's name was Stoner and all these fun, great stories. And it was just like, I actually felt like I was sitting in the house with them, you know, and obviously I, I, don't, I didn't know Merle, never got to meet Merle. I mean, I saw Merle play in Toronto many, many years ago, but I could feel and hear Merle in Tony. And even Tony now when he's on Facebook and every few days, he always talks about how proud of his dad he is and his dad taught him music and he lives his dad's memory and everything like that. And it's, it's, it's amazing that the little, little community that's here that came from these different connections. And uh, that's part of the reason why I want to reach out to you because you are a surviving member of, of that history that I, you know, you thankfully and graciously were able to talk with me. And I found that amazing. Thank you. That, that you mentioned about Merle's uh, house, the, yeah. the house in San Francisco and who came through it? It reminds me very much of the houses in New Orleans, like uh, Trombone Shorty. His house, the stories he's, he, the stories he told, of who would be marching. I mean, Louis Armstrong would actually come to his house and talk to his dad and to his uncles there. And he had a musical family. Everybody was in music and and recording. He just it was what he did. I mean, he was Shorty. He was the guy that smallest kid. He was like you know five, six years old playing trombone. I'm like well, you got to hear this little kid, you know. So it was a musical household. And that's what Merle's was. If you went there oh it wasn't the stars or anything but you just didn't know who was going to show up musically to talk to work with play with try a song out with Merle he's a great guy and what was interesting too is when Merle didn't decide and told his dad he didn't want to play piano anymore that he wanted to get into bass and how his dad reacted and actually it was um oh I can't think of the keyboard player 80s early 80s um uh blind me was not blind uh, anyways he was the one who basically told Merle let him go let him play the piano. And uh, so, was, uh, sorry, let him play the bass. And it was just an interesting story too, because you don't always, obviously you want your son to follow in your footsteps. And, and you know, all of a sudden you didn't want to play piano anymore. So just interesting to hear those different things. Yeah, the piano, the keyboard, I always say to people, it's a great instrument. Um, a, a guitar player friend of mine said, you know, you're a good guitar player, but there's like, a, you know, a dime a dozen guitar players who want to be out there. There's a, the, the, and there's, and they used to say that bass players just were guitar players that couldn't play very well. They could only handle four strings. You know, that's not true. And, you know, but it's just the way they said it. If you couldn't play guitar, you play bass. But the keyboard players would always be um, uh, uh, desirable because you could arrange, you could do other things. And you had the, the instruments there on your keyboard. I went, okay, I can play. That'd be oh. fun. And I was able to get out of that. Uh, you know, I don't think I would have stayed in music if I had been a guitar player. Maybe I might have stayed in as a more of a production. I was sort of, and I would have found my way to songwriting and everything, but I wouldn't have been, you know, the guy that you picked up to play because there were too many good ones out there, man. Everybody, everybody was better than me. <laughs> well, that, that's a perception, of course, obviously, right? Until you make it or break it, right? This is kind of a great segue to another uh, audience member asking question, Richard Lennon. 
Uh, as a musician, what would you recommend? And again, if you don't know, you don't know. What would you recommend to aspiring musicians who would like to play professionally at a level of the great musicians like yourself and Jerry Garcia to learn? So what would you recommend them to start off learning? I mean, I know you've got your wonderful CD, the DVD series, Killer Keyboards, Ki Killer Keyboard You Made Simple. Um, as in, should you learn all the music theory? Or is it, let me ask it again quickly, just that I, I, I stopped there. As a musician, what would you recommend to aspiring musicians who'd like to play professionally and at the level of great musicians like yourself and Jerry to learn? As in, should they learn all of music theory? Or is it key to learn every kind of scale? What's the most key thing to focus on to become a master guitarist, keyboardist, in your opinion? Sa saxophone players learn scales. That's important. Um, most other instrumentalists, you know, you know, or should say, you know, the woodwinds, those guys have to learn their scales, trumpet players, some with the brass. But um, it's good to know, I, don't, I can't read music, okay? I can write music. That's a scary thought. I can actually pen it out. I can write horn charts. I can write, you know, uh, lead sheets or whatever, but I, I, I have some dyslexia or some uh, ADHD that I cannot read. It does not translate those notes on there. I still have to go, every good boy does. You know, and that's- I used to write F on top of the F sharps. I used to, I, I, when I was taking viola, I had to write the number letters on top because I couldn't read it either. I hear you. <laughs> blank out. I can, I can read, you know, I can read a story. <laughs> I can read a story, but I blank out on that. So um, that, that's, a, that's a blessing. And it's a damn, you know, it's a, it's a curse and a blessing at the same time, double that. So, I, cause I, I had to be creative. I had to, you know, create my own music. And as far as theory goes, yes, every bit of theory you can get, but you don't have to, you know, you know, half diminished everything. It's not in that important because you, after you've created it, you can name it. I don't have to name it before I create it. And I don't know if that makes any sense to sure. yeah. inspiring musician, be creative first get into why you did it afterwards and why it sounds like that because it's it'll give you another roadmap of where you want to go especially if you want to keep creating your sound or whatever that is but um yeah learn um learning a suzuki piano method i don't know i just don't think it, it gives you the backbone for why it sounds like that i talk to keyboard players and guitar players they don't know why this song sounds like that or that chord sounds like that or the similarity of things you go look look at the similarities not the differences they go oh that's just a completely different no that's that same song i can take it i can put that right over that song and you know change one note and we've got it and, you know um <laughs> it's 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 only teaches me as i go it doesn't create the music it gives me the reason why it happened and it'll maybe give me some future thoughts but yeah theory is important it's nice to learn the music and if you can't play you can't play it'll usually Usually somewhere along the line, you'll find out that you're just, I, I, I don't play basketball, okay? The hoop told me. <laughs> I hear you. I'm not a musician, so I totally get it, absolutely. In there. So the hoop told me I'm not going to be in the NBA. So early on, you'll find out if you're good at things. And, and then plug away at it, you know? Yeah, no doubt, absolutely. I mean, I, I, mean I, I host musicians, like during the pandemic, I turned my garage into a live music studio because I am friends with a lot of working musicians, right? They have other jobs. Right, like the guitarist in one of my favorite local bands is also a yoga instructor most of the day because there just isn't enough work, right? And to see them like in my garage, even my good friend Joel, who's a soul jazz, got his own band, soul jazz, Hammond guy, loves it. I mean, I'm just enamored with them. And for me to watch them, they make it look so simple in terms of like when Rich is in there on the guitar with an acoustic guitar, and he's got layers on and boomerangs and he's he's yep. doing loopers and repeats and now it sounds like there's 10 musicians in the garage and it's just him and it's like wow and then what, what for me my job was it to try to look at him was how can i make that sound good to the outside world how can i make sure my internet connection's fast enough how can i chat with people to keep them engaged because he's doing what he needs to do and i'm doing my part and it was a great collaborative issue that way where eventually they the musicians would bring me into the stream and all right we're here at the news house and we're here here and they would bring me in a little bit make it fun they would learn songs for me at times and it became really you know made my heart thump a lot harder but at the same time just being in that process because a lot of times when i go to the concerts with the boys and i'm the guys and they're setting up shows i'm mute i don't talk during setup i don't talk during sound check I don't want to interfere on their process and whatever it is they're doing to get themselves in place. Now the lizards are a bit different because I mean, I work with other bands where they don't care about certain things. Lizards oh. obviously care a lot about making money. That's not their fault. It's just they're playing music 
they're good at it, but they're there to make money. And so it's, it's a different, sometimes a different beast. Like I don't do what I do for my, in, in terms of my YouTube channel, it's a mm -hmm. passion for me. And so sometimes seeing a musician bring the passion with that they need to make money together. That's a really interesting thing to, to witness because that can be sometimes more challenging. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'll sometimes say to the guys, why don't you play a show like this? They're like looking like I'm crazy. I'm like, why? I'm like, I'm a marketing guy. Now I'll get more people out. Like we don't care. We just want to play us. And I'm like, very yeah. cool. And so I've learned how to just back off a bit and not be a business marketing person. But at the same time, like in the early days with the guys, I promote their shows. I go into the group chat and go, here guys, share this. And they would just stare at me. And then eventually yeah. I'd be like this, here, do you guys want to make more money? Share this. Then they go share it. <laughs> and now it's become almost second nature where they share everything automatically because they realize that they are their music and it's part of them and they need to create that for themselves. Yeah, that's, that is great. The sharing, exactly the idea is no telling where it will go when you share it. If you hold it and you go, no, I'm going to do, I'm going to control this here. No, it may not get where it's supposed to be. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Thank you. So just quick, I want to know, can you tell me a little bit about your videos and some of the stuff you might be working on these days, how my audience can connect with you and find you as sort of my last question before I, I go into my little one little quick little drill here. Two, two things, um, uh, Killer Keyboards Made Simple had a great run. Uh, the company uh, found me and said, we want to do this series. I said, I can't sell anything. I, don't, I couldn't sell a, you know, a package of cookies. They said, we don't have to. You make the music, we will sell it. And they did, and they got it out there. I, got a, I had a great run with it. I had a webinar series. It was a lot of fun to talk, a lot like this, where people would call in and ask questions or ask this link or ask this song or you know what's similar to that you know if they were doing theory what was that so yeah i had a great run with that but um that's kind of uh, run its course and moving to, to costa rica is important to me because this is like uh this is chapter seven of my life really great i love to uh fish i love to uh be on the beach living in california the water is a little cold here and the water down there is 82 degrees and i love it um Absolutely. That's, that's that brings me to a musical process a musical project that's going on down there um there is a studio called oceano studios and oceano is uh in guanacaste uh state the state of guanacaste it is um a recording studio like no other it's really yeah. something else it's in the, in, in the jungle and the jungle meets the ocean it's a beautiful place check it out online i think there'll be um you'd be surprised at what's going on there. Not, I don't know if you'd ever get there. I don't know if you have a recording project that you're working on, but it's where people create. And we are already bringing some very wonderful creative people in there. And the people from that area, there's some Nicaraguan musicians. There are people from Miami coming down. A guy from Canada. Live is a highway. Ah, Brian Adams. Yeah. Brian Adams. There you go. There you go. Oh, no, sorry. Tom Cochran. There you go. Tom Cochran is coming down. He's he's there now working on some stuff. And I'm going, this is great, man. People are coming in from from a, around the world, basically, to do some recording there and do some uh, uh, share the music with the people and the promoters down there. There's a new event center that they want to do this together. I go, that's very exciting. And I kind of be I came to be the spokesperson for it. They just did a uh, a video um, that's going out there as a promo for a reserve account child. The um, uh, the Western Hotel, Oceano Studios, the whole thing together. And they're focusing on the old guy here telling you what, what it is that I really like about it. O C E A N O, Oceano. Yeah, right, Oceano. yeah no, I'm just writing that down. I'm going to include this. Like yeah. when I put this up later, I'm going to include all these links. Uh, that's awesome. That sounds amazing. I, I almost now want to come down and check it out and network with people and be a part of that. Sounds really amazing. It's a trip. It's like this yeah. is different. I had no idea when I was going there. I was going to, you know, I've been away from music. I did my webinar. I definitely don't want to tour anymore. No more buses with guys on them. And, and um, I just, at the point now where I was going, you know, I'm enjoying my, my life with my wife. We're having, getting to travel without, you know, going to stages, you know, to do it. <laughs> you go to the hotels and, you know, enjoy the restaurants, not, sure. not food. And um, so it's it really, um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice time. And it's, it's, it's good to see people being creative down there. And, you know, if nothing else, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing, you know, uh, uh, I guess you would call it, you know, producer, you know, uh, producer on board, ready for the projects that are coming in. And I hope to find a couple of young or, you know, aspiring people who I can give some of my, uh, my production qualities to. 
That's awesome. 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 Thank you. Um, all right. Last. Uh, so how can people find you? Obviously, you've got your website. I'm going to include that link in, in the, when I put the video up on my YouTube channel. Any other ways to look and find you or search you out online or anywhere? Well, you know, there's, it, it, it's, it's ozziology.com. It's real simple. It's, it's more of just an information. I, I, don't, I don't do live uh, updates, blogging, or anything like that now that we're doing this. It's just basically me, my photography. You can see who it was, and you can always reach me at fingers at ozziology.com. It's right there. It just says, come on, if you want to reach That's out. That's how I found you. Thank you. That's exactly how you found me, and it's exactly how people reach out with a question. And I do answer them. I, I really appreciate that people love music and, uh, you know, love the people I've learn from and all along the way and we shared with so yeah that's always there and there's a wikipedia page i'm sure there's somebody put that out there and you know google me <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's amazing i mean there's there isn't a lot but there's enough and what's, what i find really interesting about you specifically with jerry garcia band is the, the very few pictures there are with you on stage you have the one on your website which i've used before in a couple of shows i've done but so very few rare pictures of you on stage just actual pictures i found that to be very odd compared to the other guys in the band well actually merle too there's not a lot of merle either but that's much earlier so it makes sense and the photographers yeah. weren't really around as much that it where they are today whereas in the later years as well um that's really awesome and i really appreciate your time today i'm going to include all this and i realize you have a birthday coming up too june 3rd you got a birthday coming up soon yeah, I'm going to be 76 years old, man. I feel like I'm... 76 years young. 76 years young. I think it is because, uh, I, as I said, I got a new chapter opening up, man. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's a great segue for my last little um, Inside the Actor Studio. Remember, do you remember that show at all with James Lipton? He asked a bunch of questions. So my wife encouraged me. The first time I was going to do one of these conversations, I'm not an interviewer. I'm just a talker. I'm a good listener. My wife's like, here's a couple of questions to get you going. I'm like, oh, okay. I have no idea what I'm doing. All, all these look good. And I had to go do research and research. And like, oh my Lord. And I just grabbed information. Thank God I have a good memory. And I'm able just to talk and just be personable and walk through things. So I'm lucky that way. So here we go. We're ready. It's fire time. It's what is your favorite word? Gratitude. Love it. Perfect. What is your least favorite word? Sick. And just to know, there's no wrong answers here. Uh, what turned you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, they're all tied. They're all tied, but um, I love my emotions to be taken away. I love a good cry. Love. Oh, amazing. I hear that. It makes us human, right? It's who we really are at the end of the day. What turns you off? What do you not like? People who think they're actually in control. What is your favorite curse word? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? The jungle? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that too. Um, <laughs> Again, emotionally, what makes me cry is the sound of a great cathedral organ, the great pipes. What sound or noise do you dislike? It used to say hate. I don't like that word anymore, so I don't use it. This. Yeah. I, I guess there's some, some natural sounds. I, I don't like the sound of a siren. Horrible. It really gets me. It's sad. Yeah, for sure. I can, I can hear that. What profession, other than your own, would you have liked to have tented? Marine biologist. Oh, interesting. I guess Costa Rica, we know maybe our life go down that way. What profession would you not like to do? All the others. <laughs> I love it. All right, last one here before I send you back off to your wonderful life and your next chapter seven, as you suggested. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say to you when you arrive at the pearly gates? What took you so long? Ah, Dennis McNally still has my heart. His is my favorite. It was, where's the laminate? There it is. Where's my laminate? <laughs> yes. Dennis wants access. <laughs> Everybody in my dressing room. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>
Well, Ozzy, I, I really just want to say thank you again for your time today. I really enjoyed our conversation here. I really appreciate you taking the time out to sit with me and my audience and let us a little bit into your history, your knowledge with Jerry, your, your journey cool. and whatnot. And I wish you all the best in the future. And thank you so much. Great to meet you, David. Have a good day. Say hi to your audience. Um, continue doing what you're doing. It sounds like fun. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. And I will put all the links in the, in the video and hopefully some people reach out to you just to ask some questions. I wish you and your family all the best in the future and all the best in Costa Rica. And maybe we'll have an opportunity to meet again one day in person, but you know what? We'll keep in touch and thank you again for everything. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.